let me take a few moments to introduce Dr. Tim Morrow. So I want you to look out the window there and look at the sky and now transport yourself back 40,000 years. What is happening with the weather 40,000 years ago? So Dr. Tim Morrow, uh, he's gonna give us that weather forecast and tell us what's happening with the weather back then and some of the implications as we go forward. Tim spent at least 10 years uh, using satellite data to assist in forecasting at the Bureau of Meteorology in Victoria. He's also an APS Victoria member. So I'd really like you to welcome Dr. Tim Morrow to the stage. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to briefly show you uh, not so much a modern um, methodology of weather, weather forecasting, but what we did probably uh, 20 years ago, and uh, just a, a brief summary of how, what we did and how we did it. And then um, we'll, we'll go back further in time in respect to uh, the uh, conditions in this area uh, 40,000 years ago. But firstly, um, the uh, little uh, icon here um, I sympathise with the, um, the man um, because on many occasions, although we, we use modern technology and the Bureau uses four major uh, weather models, mathematical models, to create the forecast, quite a few times those, those models are pack pointing in four different directions and we have no idea. It really is just throwing a dart at the wall. So it's not uncommon. And that, that's why we do have forecasts that fail. <laughs> over the years, or I, I guess over thousands of years, um, one of, before, before modern technology and such, um, the uh, early sailors uh, sailing the seas and, the, and exploring the oceans uh, developed uh, rhymes over the years in respect to predicting weather in respect to what the, uh, the sun might be doing or the, um, the sky might be doing. So, by, so some of these um, uh, rhymes are, are reasonably true in reality because they do reflect the actual events occurring in the atmosphere at the time. One of the things that um, I guess a lot of people talk about is climate and weather, and they talk about climate and weather as being one and the both and the same. Well, unfortunately, well, well fortunately, they're not. Um, so that, uh, just to clarify the situation is, climate is the uh, average of a long-term uh, association of events. It could be for uh, a, a season, which we know is summer, winter, uh, autumn and spring, or um, could be a monthly average, could be a 12 monthly average. Uh, so that, that steps away from what we know as weather, which is what we actually forecast from a period of 24 hours ahead, or could be 48 hours ahead. With, with the modern forecast, although we give you seven days ahead, let, believe me, the, the, the sixth and seventh day, it's fantasy land sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's the difference. Paleoclimatology uh, is a science which has developed probably, oh, well, nearly 100 years, I think, at least. So that's pretty well established and uh, and most um, most people working in 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 the past paleontologists and, and so forth um, accept that uh, science and and we do have um, climate basically set into certain periods of those longer term uh, past periods meteorology of course is the science of the atmosphere and uh, we I think most people understand that. Now, paleo meteorology is a different matter. That came about um, due to some work being done uh, 
earlier this, uh, not this century, sorry, the last century in the 1900s. But I'll come to that in a minute. What I want to do, first of all, is I want to take you through the anatomy of a forecast. And the basic uh, forecast, and now I'm going to talk, talk about what we did probably 30 years ago, maybe even longer, 40 years ago, because that's, that's how we worked and the, and the data and the information that we had. So I'm going to quickly go through uh, what we need is temperature, what we need is wind, which by the way is my special speciality. Uh, air pressure, you're all familiar with the synoptic chart. Rain does not come into the equation. And I'll tell you why in a minute, we'll show you. But this does, this is moisture in the atmosphere, dissolved moisture in the atmosphere. This is done by satellite. It's a um, uh, infrared image uh, from uh, the Himawari 8, which is our uh, local satellite. And this is very important. The moisture content is, a, is, is the uh, most critical element of all. One of the things we need to know is um, what the profile of that moisture is within the atmosphere. And our, our methods now is the, well, what is still, still, still used, but the, we relied upon were the uh, blue ones which were launched um, manually. With the bottom where the, um, the operator is holding the, the blue one is a, um, a small electronics package which is transmitting uh, data to a, a receiver uh, of which we then collect that data. And then once that blue one is released, by the way, it, it, that's hydrogen in the blue one. We use, we use hydrogen, nothing else, because, um, and uh, the uh, map weighs it, the amount of hydrogen in that blue one is specified so that we know that with that volume and, and, and mass or volume of hydrogen, um, we know that the ascent rate will be constant through the atmosphere. And, it, and that, is, that is, sends around about 500 metres per second. And so by the time it gets to um, 40,000 metres, uh, which it's only a few minutes, so uh, that the um, the reason for that is so that even if we have strong winds all the way up the atmosphere, through the atmosphere, um, the blue one is rising at such a rate that it passes through those layers very quickly, uh, and uh, and basically we can we we assume that the the profile through the atmosphere virtually is a straight line vertically up and not. It does wave around a little bit, but we, we consider that that uh, is vertically aligned. And the data we get from these is, but basically out of those balloon flights, we get wind, temperature, moisture, and pressure. And uh, so, but basically what I'm, what I'm saying, saying is that without these, we, we don't really know what the moisture content of the, um, the atmosphere is. The closer those lines are together, uh, the more moisture there is in the atmosphere. For instance, at the bottom level near the surface, you can see the two lines close together. And above that, uh, there's an inversion point where the um, uh, left-hand uh, track ex extends to the left and goes up and then there's a fairly dry atmosphere above that. So between that, um, the pressure, temperature, moisture, and wind, we can develop uh, our forecast. And they're, they're the four, four or five critical uh, items that we need. These days, um, there's many more influences in the forecast. And uh, pictorially, this is what they look like. And uh, so therefore, because of, we're getting basically every day millions of uh, data points from the, the satellite we, uh, we get um, today, each, every 10 minutes we down, download two gigabytes of data every 10 minutes. So you know, we're talking huge amounts of data uh, to store. That's why we have such big computers. 
in Melbourne, we, we now have two uh, high-powered computers, and we also, with any overflow, there's a, a third one in Canberra at the Australian National University, which we also use uh, for our overflow calculations. So we, the, for the modern modern day uh, forecast, we there's a lot more data, and, and of course our our model mathematical models are getting much more complex as well. So you, you need the computing power to uh, to handle it. One of the things which should be in, taken into account but uh, is not considered is our ocean currents. This is. Um, a extract of uh, a current of currents satellite uh, images of the ocean currents and for the east coast of Australia this is the current here that I'm referring to that current has um, extensive influence for the east coast of Australia particularly along New the New South Wales coastline what um, what that current does, because it's warm, it heats up the air along the coastline. And once it heats up the air, or the air warms up, what happens? The air can carry more moisture. And and with, with um, the southwesterly winds, that moist air then is blown across the, the landform, and because the escarpment is so close, close to the, uh, the coast, um, that moisture is uplifted into the cooler areas of the, of the uh, atmosphere and it creates rain. And um, so it ha has a very important part to um, the uh, complexity of the forecast. Okay, 40,000 years ago. Well, what did we have? We were in the middle of the ice age. We had land bridges. And we have a continental shelf. And at the same time, 40,000 years ago, we had people wandering around our lands landscape. And at this time, um, we uh, had people over in Western Australia, around Perth region, and we also had them down on the southeast corner of Australia. So once again, we had influences that um, were uh, connoissant to um, the uh, the weather we're having. Um, this is just a, a simple map. It's not, it's not all that clear, but basically it's showing that um, in the southeast corner here, um, people needed to wear some sort of clothing, and they're, they're suggesting possum fur cloaks, which um, I guess was uh, the the norm and still is, of course, for some people. Uh, and so that, that suggests something about the weather. And I need to, need to clothe up, I need to put a jacket on. So it's, and that, don't forget, we're also in the middle of the ice age here, so we, we've got a, a rather a, a cool climate. So this is where it starts to get interesting, because um, Frederick Harmer, who was a a geologist and, and naturalist. He was one of the first people to coin the term paleo meteorology. So this is back in 1901. So the, although the, the name and the science have been around a long time, it's still being developed. It's, it's, it's very few people are, are not uh, are, are really looking into um, weather events in a in long, long time ago. And uh, Frederick Harvard was the, one of the first to present a paper to the Geological Society of uh, England. And um, uh, after a, a study of particular landforms, uh, rock formations in the uh, UK. So our local landforms basically you can see, see our, our coastline. This is roughly, uh, I think, um, Wollongong is just up near Bel where it says Belmore Basin and, and, and Kiamara is just uh, 
below that. Um, but what it's showing is uh, the um, softer outline is the uh, continental shelf. And this is what it looks like. <clears throat> we've got the coast and then we've got the continental shelf and then the, um, uh, the canyon uh, beyond that in the deeper ocean. And because of that, one of the interesting things is that the depth of water over the continental shelf is quite shallow. I talked about sea levels and we're talking about an ice age. Remember that all the fresh water is locked up into the ice. Therefore, the sea, the sea, le sea level is much lower and Kaima is about 200 kilometres inland from the, the coast. So what does that do? Right? It makes, makes a bit interesting suppositions. <laughs> the other thing is that, unfortunately, this is the best I could get. I, um, this is a paper pr produced by Geoscience Australia and they did a survey uh, around about 2016, I think it was. The, um, the grey shaded area is, is the current coastline and the, um, everything uh, to the right hand side in the clip is the continental shelf. And what, what this is showing is the creeks and rivers that are on the continental shelf. So at some stage you can see that there was a significant drainage systems along the, the coast, which means that we must have had a fairly high rainfall in our very early days. Because some of these uh, um, river uh, valleys are quite deep, thousands of metres. So interesting that um, uh, in that Ice Age period, and the other thing is about the Ice Age period, is that coming back to the ocean currents, some recent work has indicated that where the uh, current flowing down the um, east coast, instead of going from north to south, fl flowed from south to north, flowed in the opposite direction, which is quite incredible uh, information. I guess uh, other people talk much more expansive uh, than I can on, on this, this subject, but basically, at the time of, uh, of uh, 40,000 years ago, where we had, remember that 40,000 years ago, um, we had people already here for 20,000 years before that. So it, it, people have had, you know, we've already had a significant time of population on, on the uh, land, uh, observing and recording uh, the events of weather. So not only did they record it, weather events, but they've also recorded uh, animal uh, activity and uh, vegetation activity. So there's a lot of information in respect to what they already knew at that time. And then some, some of their rock art and uh, bark uh, art, um, the, they recorded a water hole as such as a, a spiral or uh, semicircle, uh, not semicircle, circ circular shape as a water hole. Rain they indicated as uh, strokes, angled strokes, and um, and drops. And one of the um, interesting things is uh, a bit of variation in in the recording of rain, because uh, in thunderstorms, of course, we we had lightning. Now. There's some interpretation that on the left-hand side of the rain symbol, we had can indicate not only rain but also lightning. That the uh, the, the continuous strokes could be could be lightning. Uh, that that's what I've been told in some of the interpretations. On the far left, water holes connected by running water, which indicates that at some stage. Uh, from a dry period to a wet period, the water holes 
um, have joined up because the rain has filled the river and we now have running water between the, the um, water holes. And similarly, with, on the right hand side, the river symbol, um, that can, either, can be interpreted as both a river, a continuous flowing river, or a flood. And just a few more uh, symbols that have been identified as, as various different. Um, and you can see cloudy and rainbow could be the same thing. It, it, I think what happens is that uh, it just depends on what area within the indigenous field uh, and populations and, and how they have seen these events occur and how they re are recorded. So just coming back to our um, topography uh, during the Ice Age, we now have this uh, long, uh, wide expanse of uh, dry land from the ocean because of the, the ice takes up, the, sorry, the, the water is now taken up the, the uh, water from the oceans and therefore uh, our um, water level is it's much slower. And now we've got a, um, this uh, gap between the, our current coast and, and the old coastline. So uh, as, as I say, roughly about 200 kilometres uh, to the shore from here. So yeah, it's not, not a matter of just going out the door and jumping in the water. You have to go for a bit of a hike, I think. <laughs> now, because of um, this, this chart here uh, is what's showing the um, variation in temperature, uh, not a very, I'll put it this way, it's the, the difference between uh, a baseline temperature and, and the temperature recorded, or temperature shown, I should say, in an ice core. And, uh, and it's, it's reasonably consistent uh, going back to about 10,000 years ago, and then you can see it dropped away because, it, I'm going to refer to this one, um, up the top, we have a temperature difference. Now, th this is uh, from an ice core in Antarctica, and you can see about here, around, around the uh, 15 to 20,000 years ago, um, there was a, a quantum leap jump drop in, in the temperature. Um, due to the fact that uh, this, it's also uh, been affected by events in the Northern Hemisphere as well. So, uh, it's, but it gives you an idea of um, the change in temperature uh, which, occurs, <clears throat> which occurs during an ice age. One of the things which is um, still occurring, of course, Australia is still moving on its tectonic plate. You know, we're moving north slowly and also um, we're tilting or rotating so it's not a, a constant uh, we're not constant by any means we're still still changing so with that i'm just going to go back for a minute here and what we're going to look at now is i'm going to work look at okay under these conditions, we've got a very large ice sheet to our south southwest, uh, which is off this map. Of, of, um, so, but the, you can see that the uh, the land continues, the dry land continues down beyond Victoria into Tasmania, which is which is the Tasmanian land bridge. But what we've got here, and if assuming that the uh, ocean current is flowing from south to north, which is therefore must be cold water and not warm water, we know that basically the winds are coming from the southeast because uh, there's some been recent work done in 
sand dune um, drillings and, and excavation, excavations showing that the pattern of the sand um, is showing the ripples to be orientated in that uh, northeast southwest direction. You're probably familiar, um, I'm not quite sure if that happens here, but um, yeah, because I think the shelving is too steep here. But when, where you get um, a shelving which is fairly flat um, at, on the coast, the um, you, you get those little sandbar type uh, formations in, in the sand, and that they form because of the wave action. And if the wave action is is predominant in one direction, because that's the direction that the wind is blowing. Um, and then, uh, obviously, over time, they they become covered or fossilised, and uh, hence we there's some, that's some of the information we know about which direction uh, or the wind may be blowing. So, <coughs> pardon me, the um, so therefore we've got a cold current. We've got a probably a, a, a south, southerly or southwesterly wind, and and because the ice sheet is further south, the the amount of moisture that's being carried in the air is less. So therefore, we've got a dry, cold wind blowing across the coast, and because the wind is. Uh, sorry, and because Kayama is inland at this time, 40,000 years ago, it's going to be a dry climate, a dry day, a dry, um, clear atmosphere. And uh, even though uh, the relationship between the location and the escarpment hasn't changed, in that time, in those days, um, even though with the escarpment we'll get a bit of uplift and we we'll, might have some rain across the escarpment, but certainly in respect to the uh, land mass between the coast and here, it would be, the vegetation will be more heathland, not forest. So therefore, because of that, um, the wind carries the moisture beyond the, the territory and then with the, the escarpment uplift and then get some rain. So basically because of the um, of those conditions then we would have a possible and, and remember um, we're talking about September now uh, so the seasonal changes are fairly fairly different to what they are now so that Temperature-wise, we're probably looking at five or six degrees for our, our day temperature, and uh, because of the dry, cold air uh, across running across the con, would have, it would be a, a sunny day, but it would be a cold day, and this fellow um, would be enjoying himself on the coast, a couple of hundred kilometres away, but uh, it would be a, a fair day. So that, that would give, gives you an indication of um, what the weather is like uh, that time ago. And um, uh, a little pleasant, but it'll be, it'll be quite cold. Well, just briefly, I won't, I won't play it, but basically, uh, for those who are familiar with the BBC shipping forecasts, uh, which I have been listening to since so high. Um, uh, this year, for the first time, I've, I've heard that they were forecasting cyclonic winds. Amazing. Anyway, so basically, that's uh, these are the animals at the time which were are enjoying the conditions. Just a okay, just a quick one into the future. If um, the climate continues to change as it is right now, 
in less than 200 years, the majority of the ice around the world will have melted. And it's, the current models are showing that before the ice, ice melted, we would have a sea rise at 80 metres along the southeast coast of Australia. And that's basically how we would finish up. So the coastal line here would be more or less along the, the escarpment. We would have our inland sea, which all our pre-past explorers have been looking for. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Sydney and Melbourne and a few other major cities would have had to, to um, uh, move on. M maybe by that, this time, NASA might have uh, succeeded in flying to the moon or Mars or something, so we could migrate to, to other places. Okay, that's some of the references, and basically, uh, one of, oh, okay, I'll finish there. Thanks very much. If you enjoyed this presentation, then please subscribe to our channel. Other presentations from the conference are available in this playlist, with new ones being added all the time.